Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the webinar. Today's presentation, Defend the Flock, How Avian Influenza Affects Us All, is part of the USDA's Defend the Flock campaign, promoting awareness about the importance of biosecurity and ways to prevent the spread of infectious poultry diseases. We are here today to support you and your flocks with expanded biosecurity resources. I'm Dr. Julie Gauthier with the USDA Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, or APHIS. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Dale Lauer from the Minnesota Board of Animal Health, Dr. Rocio Crespo from North Carolina State University, and Dr. Denise Hurd from the U.S. Poultry and Ag Association. A few housekeeping items before we get started. First, we want to let you know that real-time streaming captions are available for this program. To view, you can click on the CC Live Transcript button at the bottom of the screen, or for customizable captions, type the caption URL that you see on this slide, bit.ly slash feb25 dash webinar. Please use a lowercase w. Type that into your browser. The URL appears at the bottom of every slide, so you can link to captions at any time during the program. Note that that URL is case sensitive. To submit questions, click the Q&A button, also located at the bottom of the screen. APIS and our guests will answer all questions after the webinar has concluded. The Q&A will be posted along with a recording of this webinar on the APHIS website. Be sure to follow the Defend the Flock campaign on Facebook and Twitter to find out when the Q&A and the recording are available. We'll share those online destinations at the end of the webinar. Now we'll take a few minutes to introduce ourselves. I'm Julie Gauthier. I've been part of USDA APHIS for 18 years and I work exclusively on poultry health programs. I'm a veterinarian and an epidemiologist. Until a few years ago, I operated a small family farm business raising heritage breed poultry. Dr. Lauer, Lauer, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you, Julie. My name is Dale Lauer and I'm a veterinarian with the Minnesota Board of Animal Health and have been with the board for more than 30 years. In my current position as assistant director for the board, I am the poultry program director in charge of all poultry regulatory disease programs in the state. I am a Minnesota native, a Golden Gopher graduate, receiving my bachelor's and DVM from the University of Minnesota. I have been involved with all aspects of the National Poultry Improvement Plan in Minnesota serve as the official state NPIP contact for Minnesota and, as, and have also worked with the NPIP nationally. I'm stationed at the Minnesota Poultry Testing Laboratory, which is really a unique arrangement with board laboratory testing functions and regulatory poultry activities on one site in one building. I also serve as the chair of the Minnesota Emergency Disease Management Committee and have been involved with many avian influenza surveillance and response activities in Minnesota. I'm happy to be part of this webinar and being able to share some of my experiences with avian influenza. Thanks, Dr. Lauer. Dr. Crespo, please tell us about yourself. Sure, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. I am originally from Spain where I became a veterinarian. After a short time of practicing there, I moved to Canada to pursue advanced studies in poultry. I have worked as a poultry diagnostician for the California Animal Health and Food Safety Laboratory for a little over 10 years, then moved to Washington State, where I joined the Avian Diagnostic Lab. I have been trained in foreign animal diseases, and also, fortunately or not, have first-hand experience with both most scary diseases of poultry, virulent Newcastle disease and highly pathogenic avian influenza. About three years ago, my family and I moved to North Carolina State. At North Carolina State University, I am the poultry program coordinator for the veterinary students and manage the post-veterinary professional development poultry training program. I organize and manage 
the Mobile Poultry Clinic at the university. This clinic serves small producers in North Carolina, and it is used as another training tool for veterinary students. I am honored to be part of this seminar today. Thank you, Dr. Cuspo. Dr. Hurd, please tell us about yourself. Thanks, Julie, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Denise Hurd, a poultry veterinarian, and I also serve as the Director of Research Programs for the U.S. Poultry and Ag Association, also called U.S. Poultry. U.S. Poultry is the world's largest and most active poultry organization. The association progressively serves its poultry and egg members through research, education, communications, and technical services. Our research grants program encompasses all segments of the broiler, turkey, and commercial egg operations, funding over a million dollars worth of poultry research each year. I am a triple bulldog having received my bachelor's degree, doctorate of veterinary medicine, and a master's of avian medicine, all at the University of Georgia. Prior to my current position, I served as the senior coordinator for the USDA National Poultry Improvement Program for nine years. I am delighted to be participating in the webinar today. Thank you, Dr. Hurd. The US poultry industry is one of the largest in the world and it's an important sector of our agricultural economy. We also have a long, rich heritage of raising backyard poultry in the United States. And many of us enjoy keeping a family poultry flock for a combination of reasons, such as fun, competition, tradition, or a little income. Disease outbreaks such as avian influenza lead to devastation of our flocks and result in job and financial losses, quarantines that limit trade, and increased prices or decreased availability of eggs, poultry meat, and other poultry products. Through the Defend the Flock program, we encourage you and all flock owners to prepare for poultry disease outbreaks and make biosecurity an everyday practice. Biosecurity means using all your available methods to keep diseases and the germs they carry away from birds, property, and people, and turning these methods into your everyday habits. Keeping birds safe from infectious disease is a top priority, and it's a responsibility for all owners, growers, workers, and enthusiasts who raise poultry successfully. I want to emphasize that biosecurity can protect your flock not only from rare and terrible diseases like highly pathogenic avian influenza, but also from more common conditions that are a drag on our birds' well-being and productivity. Fortunately, most flock keepers have never experienced a serious outbreak of poultry disease. And hopefully with good fortune and good biosecurity, you never will. My guests and I want to show you firsthand how devastating poultry disease outbreaks can be to poultry keepers and their communities, and to inspire you to keep up your biosecurity practices to prevent the consequences that you're about to hear. We'll talk about the disease that my guests and I are most concerned about that's highly pathogenic avian influenza, or HPAI for short. This disease is caused by influenza viruses that can easily infect poultry and a variety of other birds. These viruses can occasionally infect animals other than birds, and in rare cases, infect people. In recent years, the avian influenza viruses that started the outbreaks in the United States, they were introduced to domestic poultry flocks by wild migratory birds. After that wild bird introduction to a domestic flock, the virus spread between domestic flocks in a variety of ways, usually involving people's activities. Infected birds shed HPAI virus from their eyes, their nose, and their mouths, and spread the virus directly from bird to bird. The virus can remain alive for a short time on surfaces of things that infected birds have contaminated, like transport crates or a shovel or your hands, and those contaminated things can carry the virus to another flock of birds. HPAI makes the entire flock sick. Nearly 100% of the birds will show signs, and the mortality rate, the death rate, is very, very high. Nearly 100% of the flock might die. Early on in the disease, sick birds are lethargic, they're depressed, they're moving around and eating and drinking less than usual. They might sneeze or have runny eyes or nose, or develop swellings on their combs and wattles. 
You might see purple bruising on the non-feathered parts of their bodies. There is no treatment for HPAI, and the most effective way to respond to the infection is to depopulate the flock to quickly end the bird's suffering and stop the virus from reproducing and spreading to another flock. Dr. Dale Auer witnessed these signs in many turkey flocks in Minnesota in 2015 during the worst HPAI outbreak the United States has ever seen. I asked him to share his experience and his views about biosecurity being the key to preventing this from happening again. Thank you for speaking with me today, Dale. Over the years, Minnesota has been associated with influenza and poultry. Why is that? Well, Julie, Minnesota is known across the country as the land of 10,000 lakes, which is good for the public in terms of recreational activities. However, for poultry producers, especially turkey growers, often these lakes, potholes, and nesting areas are near major poultry production areas. As the number one turkey production state in the country, this presents some unique disease issues. Minnesota is also a major wild bird migratory route. And as a result of influenza viruses being transmitted by wild migratory birds, it is a reality that growers need to deal with. And how has Minnesota handled these influenza introductions? Well, Minnesota has experienced numerous introductions of influenza in domestic poultry, mostly commercial turkeys. The turkey industry has learned many lessons regarding influenza introductions, some tough lessons, some from the school of hard knocks. Prior to the adaptation of uh, adoption of the LPAI surveillance and response programs with the NPIP, surveillance and response were led by the industry. What began as an industry only surveillance and response program eventually became a cooperative effort between Minnesota's turkey industry, the board, and researchers at the University of Minnesota. The term responsible response was coined. This response included year-round surveillance of all turkey flocks being marketed, sharing that information with industry partners so that they can take appropriate action and other efforts to ensure that influenza viruses do not continue to circulate. With the National Poultry Improvement Plan, uh, low pathogenic avian influenza program, and requirement for an emergency disease management committee, the response in Minnesota and other states became a more formal written state response plan. In either case, the industry is familiar with working with the board on an avian influenza surveillance and response program. You and I worked together in Minnesota in 2015 to respond to that largest outbreak of HPAI in US history. Can you describe what was going through your mind when you received that first call confirming an infection in a Minnesota poultry flock? Well, yes, I do. We had convened our first meeting of the Emergency Disease Management Committee, our EDMC in January of that year. And we're tracking reports of HPAI and wild birds and domestic poultry flocks on the West Coast in Canada. As we do every year, the week began planning for the next authorized poultry testing agent course. The board trains individuals to assist with sample collection and testing in the field. I distinctly remember that Monday morning, the first week in March, when a lab technician delivered samples from a turkey breeder replacement flock in West Central Minnesota that was experiencing some significant mortality over the past seven to 10 days. After additional samples were collected and the board had confirmation from the National Veterinary Services Lab in Ames, things changed quickly. Cancellations were made, the EDMC board and USDA staff were contacted and our incident management team was stood up. We met and worked from the Emergency Operations Center located at the Candy, Ohio County Law Enforcement Center in Wilmer. I had worked with the EOC director before, the EDMC had met at that facility earlier and we were quite familiar with this resource. In retrospect, this was an important component of the response, 
response as the event continued. It was my hope, truly my hope, that this was a once and done. With no additional cases for three weeks, I was wondering, could this be true? Unfortunately not. We were now dealing with a foreign animal disease, HPAI. And how did your response change as you continued to identify those positive flocks? Well, Julie, after the first confirmation from NBSL and after three weeks with new, no, new cases, the event began to take off. In late March, while I was at an outstate meeting with board and USDA field staff, I received calls from two poultry veterinarians that I have worked with for many years. I, I became alarmed when these reports came from two different companies two commercial turkey premises 60 miles apart, one located in central Minnesota and the other in southwest Minnesota, two different geographic locations. The clinical signs of extreme depression were reported by both. I think I've got it, they said. So this was our second and third commercial turkey flocks with HPAI, which we could have handled better, but we had a delayed diagnosis depopulation and response efforts. However, this was not a lack of effort, but truly a, a lack of resources and knowledge of HPAI. Minnesota was learning and dealing with a foreign animal disease. The EOC was moved to, to the Stearns County Law Enforcement Center as now the virus had moved into one of our major poultry production counties. Suddenly testing test supplies, depopulation equipment, KIFCO units, control zones, permitted movement became terms we soon were very familiar with. In April, as positive flocks continued to be added, we suspended activities for the Easter holiday weekend. However, that was short-lived as Easter Sunday found me in the Twin Cities for yet another EOC relocation. A USDA incident management team was requested Positive cases continued from across the state. On April 23rd, 2015, Governor Mark Dayton declared a peacetime state of emergency. It happened to be my birthday. Happy birthday, Dale. In late April, the first commercial chicken layer flock was identified with HPAI. When all the flocks were accumulated and identified HPAI was identified in 23 of the 87 Minnesota counties. State veterinarian Bill Hartman at the time was quoted as saying, Minnesota was ready for a tornado, but not a tsunami. And the media requests, as you probably would expect, continued asking, what is happening? And what did those turkey growers tell you about how their birds looked and acted when they suspected they were infected with avian influenza virus? Well, Julie, I talked to a lot of growers and I received a lot of voicemails and, and certainly these were dark times. The overwhelming response that I heard from turkey growers was, I think we have it. This was followed by a description of extreme flock depression, flocks quiet, with increasing mortality. Growers would tell me they opened the door to the barn for chores and then close it immediately and call the board. A producer would report they just don't look right. In the morning, there's always lots of chattering, running, flying and jumping, but there was none of that. It was just complete silence. And these were experienced turkey growers who know turkeys and keep constant watch over their birds. They would call supporting each other if they knew of someone else who was affected wondering which farm would be next and will I get it. We all became pretty good at texting those days. Producers would be texting each other at four o'clock in the morning or late at night in their barns or in their offices. You know, nobody was getting too much sleep. You know, you would sleep out of sheer exhaustion and the moment you'd wake up, your mind would start up again another day. I remember you spent a lot of time on the phone with turkey growers and flock veterinarians. They were very stressed during that outbreak. What were they telling you? What, what was happening to them? And what were their fears? 
Well, the first question was, will I be next? Am I going to lose everything? And who will help me if my flock is positive? We've been through these tough times, but you know what? This is the worst. We are really struggling with this unprecedented event, avian health experts at the University of Minnesota told us. We are in a situation where we answer one question and come up with 16 more. However, not all producers were affected and those who are not, how do we keep, the, how do we keep business going for those growers, for those companies that were not affected? Fortunately, poultry supply plans, risk-based plans were being used to keep commerce going. Early in the event when the EOC was moved back to Candy, Ohio County, I was sure to make sure that our poultry industry veterinarians and commodity group representatives became part of the response at the ground level. Their input, comments, and presence were extremely helpful as problems were discussed and as the event continued. You know, Julie, often it comes down to communication, cooperation, and collaboration. The outbreak was so widespread in certain Minnesota counties that the whole community was affected. What were the consequences of the outbreak for people who didn't own or care for poultry in those affected areas? You know, when people would call or even when I would visit with uh, people in the community, you know, questions like, is my food safe? Where are all the eggs in the grocery store? And will I catch bird flu from the turkeys? If I'm a farm employee, should I go to work on the farm? And what are all these people showing up in white suits in Candy, Ohio County? You know, with breeder and commercial turkey flocks being put down, what is the impact for growers if no poults are around or being produced? Is unemployment looming on the horizon? On May 15th, 2015, the Minnesota poultry exhibitions that included the Minnesota State Fair were canceled for the 2015 season. It certainly was a big letdown for those who had a visit to the state fair in 2015 in their plans. You know, I believe that when Governor Dayton declared a peacetime state of emergency, the citizens of Minnesota realized the significance of this event to Minnesota agriculture and to the Minnesota poultry industry. Members of the legislature came together with the governor to free up state resources to combat HPAI but they also provided financial support to renovate the MPTL, providing a testing option for producers and veterinarians at a laboratory in outstate Minnesota. It truly was an all hands on deck event. You know, Julie, and you certainly remember that Candy Ohio County, the EOC and Wilmer was home for many outstate responders who helped us with this event. And you know, those folks, they miss birthday parties, they miss graduations, weddings, a lot of other different things. And so for all of those who are on this webinar, who are listening, and you know who you are, thank you. Those were dark days, and I don't wanna leave us in that place. Uh, the rest of the story is that by July of 2015, the, the virus had been eradicated and the food supply remained safe and no human infections were discovered. The producers were on the road to recovery, right, Dale? You know what, Julie, we've got a resilient group here in Minnesota. Um, certainly, you know, better times were ahead, better days were ahead. You know, and, and I think, you know, we're still on alert in the fall and the spring, but, but certainly it's, it's something that we deal with. But, you know, as I look back, we certainly are in a better place than we were then. HPAI doesn't just affect large commercial poultry flocks. Birds in small backyard flocks are just as susceptible to these viruses. Dr. Rocio Crespo can give a firsthand account of an HPAI outbreak that affected only backyard flocks in the northwestern part of the country in 2014, 2015. Thank you for being here and sharing your story, Rocio. You worked in the state of Washington during an avian influenza outbreak in backyard flocks in 2014. I was there also for a few weeks to help with the response, and I met small flock owners 
who are grieving for the loss of their birds due to the virus. Could you describe how avian influenza affected the small flocks? Sure, Julie. As I mentioned earlier, that for him was the beginning of the year. For us in Washington, we were just getting ready for the winter holidays when we heard from our colleagues in British Columbia, Canada, of an outbreak of highly pathogenic avian influenza, or HPAI, in their commercial poultry flocks in the Fraser Valley. If you are not familiar with the area, the Fraser Valley is the most densely concentration of commercial poultry in the province of British Columbia. This valley is located less than five miles north from the U.S. border. Sure uh, that uh, from the slide, the numbers of flocks and birds affected is not as impressive, impressive as what is happening in commercial poultry, but the impact to poultry owners was major. I must point out the, this communication that happened between Canada and Washington is very important because as soon as we heard, we ramped up surveillance efforts near the border looking for possible incursions of this deadly virus. Because of this effort, we were able to detect HPAI quickly in two independent sites simultaneously. One was in a falconer operation and the second in a lake where increased mortality in wild ducks was observed. Both sites were near each other and very close proximity to the border with Canada. Once the virus was confirmed, surveillance efforts were intensified even more. Additionally, education and communication efforts in town hall meeting format with small flock owners near the border were initiated. The goal of these meetings was to inform the neighbors of the findings and prepare the owners in what was going to happen during the surveillance. During the meetings, we offered tools and skills to protect their own flocks. A major benefit of this town hall meeting was to personally meet the neighbors and state officials. Who, and those state officials were able to answer questions to the stakeholders rather than leaving it to social media. We communicate and relate with people. We don't communicate, communicate with large entities or with government. This was a good strategy in Washington state as people realized that veterinarians and state and federal officials were part of the team and they were trying to protect their flocks, they were all in. Even with good communications, we had several losses. Some were locking pets and honest grief their loss. Some of those small flocks were rare heritage breeds and they had to be destroyed. With this came the loss of income for the small flock producers. They saw genetic stock that they have been selecting and breeding for several years completely lost because of this outbreak. An interesting observation here, and I want to pause. During the high pathogenic avian influenza outbreak, all five small flocks, as well as the falconer premise in Washington state that were infected with this virus, had contact with wild ducks. As I said earlier, with small flocks, a major challenge is communication. Social media moves much faster as it is not monitored or controlled in any way. There is a lot of misinformation and verified posts, and so it can spread wrong information and even point fingers or blame innocent people. On the other hand, official communications may move slower and the warden is a little bit less colorful. So what's decided is that everything that went out to an affected flock, a communication person will be coming along with them. This communication person was in charge to answer questions to the small flock owner, as well as to the neighbors or even the press. When we go onto a property with full protective gear, such as the white suits, gloves, caps, boots, masks, people wonder. They ask, what is going on? So there was always someone to speak with them and calm them down. Something I want to note is that the owners of small flocks really care for their animals. 
it is not so much the dollar value of their animal or animals, but it is more the personal interaction and the bond they have with these birds. In some occasions, these animals have names, and the owners know their different characters and behaviors. These owners want to protect their birds as anyone wants to protect their loving pet cat or dog. And there were consequences for small flock owners who were not affected directly by the avian influenza virus, right? Yeah, certainly there was uh, consequences uh, for um, those flocks that were not affected directly by the avian influenza. As I said, the birds from directly affected flocks were put down. That was unfortunate. Uh, there was lots of genetics, and uh, the same as it happened in Minnesota, many fairs and shows were canceled. People were not able to show or sell birds, which resulted in loss of income. There was a mistrust between small flocks and commercial poultry. Commercial poultry saw these small flocks as incubators for HPAI. However, because of the little exchange between these two types of production, there was no infection from small flocks to large producers. Still, lots of communication went underway in both small flocks and commercial farms. Something positive that came out of the HPAI outbreak was education on biosecurity to small flock owners. This was the first time some owners heard of how to protect a flock. One of the major impacts, for instance, although this is not an example of poultry, was with the falconers. Uh, they changed the way they feed uh, their birds. Until HPAI hit, they, will, uh, they were splitting the carcasses and dividing these carcasses among multiple birds. After HPAI, they learned to feed a single carcass to a single bird to prevent infecting multiple raptors. Similarly, small flocks uh, increased their own biosecurity. We had the increased reports of mortality we learn what it is out in the small flocks. Fortunately, most of it was not related to avian influenza. There were also many questions related to the potential of virus uh, passing to humans. And as they uh, said, many owners were asking if it was safe to consume the eggs from their uh, birds. HPAI outbreaks create a rippling effect of negative impacts, even on people who don't raise poultry. Dr. Denise Hurd, in her role with U.S. Poultry and Egg Association, represents a wide range of people who have a stake in poultry production in the United States. And she has direct knowledge of how HPAI outbreaks affect business, jobs, and consumers. Thanks for talking with us, Denise. Grocery stores and restaurants are places where we might see effects from avian influenza outbreaks. How did the 2015 outbreak affect these businesses? Thanks, Julie. Yes, the, the table egg industry was hit pretty hard. Detections went from zero to over 30 million in only a few weeks, encompassing approximately 41 million birds, consisting of 35 million layers and 6 million pullets. Layer sites affected represented only 14% of the outbreak, but they represented 70% of the affected birds because of the large size of the premises affected. The United States exports a relatively small percentage of its annual egg production, but lost over 10% of the national laying hen inventory to the HPAI outbreak. In aggregate, the 2015 HPAI outbreak restricted the supply of eggs on the market, leading to the highest egg prices observed in more than 30 years after adjusting for inflation. The worst of the HPAI outbreak was restricted to the Midwest, but the impact of the price effects were seen across the country. On the turkey side, you have already heard from Dell that there were devastating economic effects felt by turkey growers and production companies. Further, there were issues fulfilling contracts and discussions began revolving around the need to potentially import turkey meat from other countries, though I don't know at what percentage that actually happened. The broiler industry received the least impact. 
However, valuable lessons were learned and enhanced biosecurity measures and proactive preparation plans did ensue. International trade is a large component of the U.S. poultry industry. How is um, industry international trade with other countries affected by HPA outbreaks? Good question. HPAI outbreaks in the U.S. impact international trade of U.S. poultry consistent of live and products immediately by means of imposed restrictions on exports. These restrictions vary depending on the importing country and its policies. Some may ban imports from the entire country, whereas others at the other end of the spectrum may only restrict a small area around the index premises known as zoning or regionalization, usually following the international guidelines for trade by the International Organization for Animal Health, better known as the OIE, which describes zoning in distances, in distances of six to 10 kilometers around the index premises for the different activities related to animal movement and surveillance. Most countries adhering to these guidelines will take the 10 kilometer radius as the area from which they will not accept product from. Other countries may impose restrictions to trade with policies somewhere in between. The length of time the restrictions are applied also vary, but it tends to be at least three months. In some more extreme cases, it has lasted years. The diplomatic relations tend to play a big role in determining how long restrictions are upheld. The impact on trade in this case is immediately evident, amounting to millions of dollars in losses due to the inability to export. Should small flock owners who aren't directly involved in international trade or even commerce across state lines be concerned about these trade impacts? Yes, I think it is important for small flock owners to be aware of these trade impacts. Plan the good neighbor role is a simple answer, but we need to keep in mind that all flocks, large and small, intensive or backyard, and anything in between are susceptible to infection by this terrible disease. If and when HPAI outbreaks occur in any given area, all flocks, whether commercial or small, are susceptible to the disease, thereby an interest to those flock owners not involved in international trade to be concerned with being aware of this disease and also to implement biosecurity practices that intend to keep the diseases out. Some small producers might not participate in international trade, but they may do regional commerce with their birds and products. And when HPAI hits a region, local veterinary authorities are likely to impose local restrictions to animal movement and thus also impacting those small producers. In fact, even low path AI and backyard flocks can impact trade. HPAI is a disease no one benefits from getting while it's in everyone's best interest to keep out. Quite a few businesses provide services or technical support and equipment to the poultry industry. How do HPAI outbreaks affect the allied industries? That's a great question. And as discussed several times before, HPAI affects everyone working in the poultry industry. The allied industry provides a great deal of customer support to their clients using their products. And during HPAI, the allied industry representatives cannot visit customers and troubleshoot their issues or problems, thus business is impeded or lost. Furthermore, progress and timelines for any research field trials ongoing are affected as well. And you and I have talked previously about how, um, how it's so important that uh, we have consumer education and, and transparency uh, with communicating with consumers. Why is it important to communicate well and openly with consumers during HPAI outbreaks? That's super important. And I don't think the importance of that can be overstated. Uh, USDA, both FSIS and APHIS were very good partners in providing information to the general public during the 2015 HPAI outbreak. Consumers have lots of questions and concerns, whether it's about the people with the white suits on or wondering if HPAI is contagious to humans and if they can get it from eating their poultry. 
Uh, APHIS did an excellent job in being open as to where new cases were found while keeping everyone calm at the same time um, when we had new findings. We just spent a lot of time looking back. Now let's look forward. Dale, are we better prepared for 2021 and beyond? You know, Julie, yes, I think we are better prepared. You know, we've really learned a lot in these last six years since we've had um, HPAI in Minnesota. You know, I think all of the people who are tuned into this webinar and our listeners who are, are taking it in, really, you know, I've got a short list of keys that everybody should be aware of, they should know, they should be able to explain if asked. You know, our listeners, poultry producers, large and small, should know the signs of HBAI. If there's an unexplained increase in mortality, a decreased egg production, respiratory signs, as I mentioned uh, when I talked about the turkeys in Minnesota, this extreme uh, quietness, depression of the birds, sometimes you might even see some of these neurologic signs, um, they should be investigated. Uh, you should make sure that people who work with your birds, whether it's you, whether it's your workers during the week or on the weekend, they should know what to look for. And certainly they should report what they're seeing. If you have a veterinarian, you should uh, describe the signs, um, have them, him or her, come in for a diagnosis. If you don't have a veterinarian, you certainly should contact your state animal health official. You have to make sure that if you have and need a diagnosis that the proper samples are collected and that they're collected by an individual who is trained and or certified by your state animal health official, state veterinarian's office, because they will know the correct number of samples and the correct type of samples and the laboratory that can conduct this type of testing. Another thing I think all of our listeners should know about is preventing exposure and certainly we have talked a lot about biosecurity. Poultry producers should be following their biosecurity plan. Biosecurity can prevent avian influenza if you use it consistently. Pay special attention to the line of separation and perimeter buffer area. Carefully follow safe entry and exit procedures into your flock. You know, we're heading into the spring now and that those weather conditions can make these procedures difficult because of mud, rain, wind, and other shifting weather conditions. At the same time, puddles and other standing water may attract waterfall to get even closer to barns. So this is the time to really focus on safe barn entries. Making sure that garbage and dead birds are picked out outside of your perimeter buffer area is a crucial and really important is, as the virus can certainly move through movement of dead birds and garbage off the farm. And lastly, on my short list is, if you see something, say something. You know, remind everyone that you talk to, including the weekend health, about their role in farms biosecurity. You really need to evaluate the risks that are unique to your operation, encourage employees to ask questions and participate in protecting your flocks. Because certainly as Denise mentioned, um, an introduction of HPAI affects you, but it moreover affects the poultry industry overall, even throughout the country. And certainly we want to make sure that our poultry industry and our stakeholders are protected from another introduction of this terrible disease. Rocio, I'll ask you the same question that I asked Dale. Are we better prepared now than we were in 2014 for the for future avian influenza outbreaks? Well, I would like to say yes, uh, but uh, that we are better prepared in terms of communication with owners and producers. On the other hand, I am afraid that many small flocks are not very well prepared uh, we have many new poultry owners due to the COVID-19 outbreak. These new poultry owners are unaware or not familiar with the events of 2014-2015. Also, there are many small animal veterinarians who are now looking after these small poultry flocks that are not aware of the symptoms 
or the legislation around poultry. So uh, there is still work to do. We are better in communication, but we there is room for improvement. Denise, what's your opinion about the level of preparedness for future avian influenza outbreaks? Julie, I think that we are better prepared. We learned the lessons from the 2015 outbreak and other devastating avian outbreaks that occurred subsequently. We now have a national biosecurity program for the commercial poultry industry. Additionally, we have a poultry primary breeder avian influenza compartmentalization program to protect the exportation of poultry and poultry products. Federal and state representatives, as well as the industry, have all done their parts to ensure that we are better prepared and equipped to handle such an ordeal. Finally, I'd like to ask each of you, what's the most important thing that you want people who keep or care about poultry to know about preventing avian influenza outbreaks? Dale, will you start? Well, Julie, I'm gonna take the Boy Scout motto, be prepared. I think you need to be prepared at the farm level understanding your farm biosecurity, and certainly um, something that uh, a tagline that I've hung on to is, say what you do, do what you say. I would also suggest not delaying a diagnosis and certainly knowing who your state animal health official or your state veterinarian's office. You know, Ben Franklin had a quote, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. In 2014 and 2015, it was Minnesota and 20 other states that were impacted by HPAI. And there's no way to predict what will happen in 21. So prepare, don't panic. Rocio, what is your take home message for us? So for small flocks, um, I recommend they become familiar with biosecurity, another means that we can use to prevent disease in the, in the birds. Um, contact your state veterinarian or extension office and get education on how to control certain diseases. If a small flock owner decides to raise multiple species, be aware of the risks and learn how to manage multiple species on the same property. High pathogen influenza not only affects the infected flock, but also affects your neighbors whether they have poultry or not. Denise, I'll give you the last word. What is it we should remember? Thanks, Julie, for giving me the last word and I'll leave everyone with this. Biosecurity, biosecurity, biosecurity. We must remain vigilant and constantly take steps to protect flocks at all times, during peacetime as well as during wartime. For international trade, we have to maintain those good relationships with our trading partners because they're key for continuity of business. At all times, we must not become complacent. It's been a pleasure working with you, Dale, Rocio, and Denise. Thank you very much for your willingness to share your experiences. I hope we work together again soon, not in an outbreak, but on a preparedness exercise. I'll conclude our presentation with an overview of the resources available through USDA APHIS that will help you prepare for poultry disease outbreaks and make biosecurity an everyday practice. APHIS Veterinary Services has developed a library of checklists that provide practical tips and recommendations. We encourage you to visit the Defend the Flock website to view and download these materials. All the checklists are available in multiple languages, including Spanish, Chinese, Vietnamese, and Tagalog. On our website, you'll find lots of other free tools, including videos, recordings of our previ previous webinars, info cards, newsletters, posters, and other resources. APHIS has also created social media content to help promote biosecurity. Infographics covering many best practices are available in English and Spanish. We hope that you will share these with your colleagues and fellow poultry keepers on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and other social media channels to make sure everyone is using biosecurity every day, every time, no matter the size of the flock. 
Be sure to check out more helpful information on our social media channels. This presentation, along with answers to your questions, will be available for download from the Defend the Flock website shortly. Be sure to follow the Defend the Flock on Facebook and Twitter to be notified when the presentation is available. And before we go, on behalf of APHIS, thank you to Dale, Rocio, and Denise for sharing your valuable insights and knowledge with us today. And thanks to all of you for joining us on this webinar. Let's keep our poultry healthy together.